Uh, today we are going to talk about the relationship between culture and crime. Uh, more specifically, we will look at how media represent crime, deviancy and crime control. This is a summary of a module that I lead for first year students, it's a second term module, which is titled Crime, Media and Culture. Right, I will start with some images, talking about media, talking about crime, we will start with some images. I prepare for you some images representing bloody knuckles. Now, one of the questions we might address looking at those pictures is whether or not they are just about flesh and blood or also about culture and meaning. Now, to answer to this question we might want to address another question like wonder why these knuckles knuckles are bleeding did someone hit somebody and perhaps was this somebody a girlfriend doing the domestic violence act or a police officer or demonstrator doing a riot it was an opponent in a boxing ring or an elderly doing a bulgari so depending from the answer to these questions, we might have a different reaction to those images of bloody knuckles. So this means that in somehow an act of violence or an act of crime is interpreted depending from the culture and social context in which it is perpetrated. So in somehow we can say as the approach to this model, the criminological approach carried on in this model, culture criminology says, we can look at violence and crime as a sort of communicative work, in that crime and violence and crime control go meanings, uh, have emotion meanings and cultural factor attached to it. For example, if we come back in time and we look at the patriarchal society of the 1940s, 1950s, when women were regularly, uh, more, more often than not, portrayed as uh, as wives, whose main uh, uh, role was to give birth to kids, look after the house, look after the husband, within this strongly patriarchal culture and social context, domestic violence was not a crime. Those husbands that committed a domestic violence were not violating the criminal law in this country as in other European countries. Actually, paradoxically, those husbands were in some way reaffirming, educating the, the, their wives, reaffirming their patriarchal and masculine power by beating up their wife and somehow demonstrating care for their wives. So if this is the case, there it seems that physical violence or crime in general might start and stop, but the meanings that we attach to them, when all the crime meanings that people attach to their own act of violence, to their own criminal activities, might continue to exist. The same thing if we go 100 years ago, to be a homosexual was a crime. So crime is something that we also construct. Nowadays, the certain activities are criminal in certain countries and no criminal in other countries. So it's also a social construct. So that's what culture criminology is about. Culture criminology explores the many ways in which culture forces interact with the practice of crime, crime control, deviances, violence in contemporary society. It emphasizes the centrality of meaning, representation, and power, like the power of the husband in the patriarchal society that reaffirms this power by beating up his wife, and this is not seen as a crime, in the always contested construction of crime. Now, to better understand what is culture criminology, we can compare it with mainstream or conventional criminology. This latter focuses on facts, on crime. It tends to measure, to count them through statistic and quantitative methods in order to achieve reliability and uh, with the ultimate aim to crime control and prevention. And prevention. Conventional criminology indeed is police oriented. By contrast, cultural criminology focuses on meanings, experiences, and emotions. 
uses participant observation as a method, ethnography, which belongs to the tradition of anthropology. It aims at revealing the meanings and consequences of crime and kind control and the interaction between representation, interpretation, and emotion. So whereas conventional criminology might want to count how many cases of domestic violence that are in a given area of London in a given period, cultural criminology will look at the meaning of this act of domestic violence, at the culture, emotions, uh, cultural meanings, emotion, interpretation, and uh, attached to those cases of domestic violence. <laughs> Now, in terms of methodology, cultural criminologists have mainly two approach to analyze um, uh, culture representation, uh, well, cal culture factor attached to crime and crime control. First one, as I say, is ethnography and field work practices. The second one is the one that we are interested in is the analysis of media. Media are culture artifact, whether we talk about a movie or a TV series or a news program or a newspaper or a book or a comic book. Those are culture representation of, uh, which are attached to a given society, which reproduce and reflect the culture of a given society. So by looking at media, we can understand how crime is constructed within a given context, within a given culture and society. Now, before looking at media, we have to define medias. A good way to do that, uh, before looking at even at the connection between media and crime, how media represent crime, we have to distinguish between old or mass media and new or digital media, between tabloid and more serious media, between mainstream and alternative media, and again, the, between uh, different forms of media, we can talk about television, uh, and which is divided between satellite, digital cable, we can talk about newspapers, magazines, radio, and the internet, and so on and so forth. Now, once we define media, just to understand the link between media and crime, just to understand how media represent crime, and what kind of, uh, how this is influenced by the culture uh, in which the media operate by what meanings the media attach to this type of representation, we need to carry on three analytical stages. The first one focus on media content, how media represent crime. The second one, the media production ownership, why media represent crime the, the way they do. And finally, we have to look at the effect, which are the consequences of this type of representation for viewers. Now, the first step is again, media content. Now, media content, briefly, we can analyze media content in two ways. The first one is a quantitative analysis. We start to count how many times in a newspaper or in a news program or in, uh, in, a TV, uh, in, in TV programs in general, how many times the topic crime is repeated, how many times the topic violence is repeated. And so, and then we can compare this with the real figure that uh, official statistics gives to us. On the contrary, quantity, qualitative content analysis look at the way, not, not so much at the amount of times uh, the word crime or violence or the topic crime and violence are, um, are present in the media, but at the way they are constructed, uh, the narrative through which this crime and this violence are represented. Now, Apart from the content analysis, in terms of media content, we know, research, academic research tell us that in the media, we can even from our everyday experience, we can even confirm that, that in the media, there is a huge amount of crime, whether it is real or fictional. I invite you to do a to write crime or to write violence in any of the platform we can uh, use today, such as Netflix, Netflix or Prime Video, to series whether they are series, TV series regarding real or fictional crime, real or fictional violence are the most popular one. Absolutely, there is no award such as crime and violence that can give you so many results in platforms such as Netflix or even YouTube or even uh, Prime, uh, Prime Video. So it, there is a huge amount of crime in the media. Most of the crime that are represented in the media are violent crime against individuals. But however, this is in contrast with what the statistics tell us. Statistics tell, tell us that the, 
the most frequent crime are not the violent crime. However, in media, the most frequent crime is violent. Then the risk of crime as, uh, uh, as portrayed by the media, both quantitatively and qualitatively, more serious than the official statistics tell us. And often media narrative are focused on victims of crimes. Now, these are how media represent crime. Why media represent crime in this way? Why media exaggerate the amount of crime? Because crime and fear sells. Yet I have to introduce with the notion of newsworthiness, okay? Which is a term that refers to the decision process that journalists, editors take when they select, when they decide what event to cover, what event not to cover. Now, such decisions are strongly affected by commercial imperatives. They are driven by profit. So they realize the media corporation, the media market, they realize that the crime and fear sells a lot. Uh, and therefore they reproduce this because the market is mainly profit oriented. This has got a criminogenic effect in that the media institution paint a distorted picture of crime in society. They tend to exaggerate the incidence of sexual violence, for instance, or violent crime in general. And of course, this is, can have, and we will see this in terms of media effect, can have and can influence people's behavior. People might get more scared, might develop an idea of a very mean and dangerous world which is less than the one, actually, the, the, the one that actually the media portrayed. So we'll be looking at media content, the way media represent crime, we'll be looking at media production, why media represent crime in this way, because it sells now, which are the effects. There are two major perspectives on this. The first one is the conservative perspective within which the so-called hypodermic syringe model was developed. According to this model, there is a casual relationship between viewing media violence and having violent faults and behave. How many times we read in the newspaper that for young kids, for instance, playing uh, violent video games or watching violent movie might affect the BM, they might develop more violent behave or more violent faults and so on and so forth. The methodology, that these uh, conservative perspectives uses is the so-called laboratory experiment with control groups. On the contrary, the progressive perspective developed another model of media effect, the so-called accumulation model. They say that media representation of violence cultivates, especially for heavy watchers, heavy viewers, for those that watch a lot of media content, an idea of a mean world. The world is very dangerous. This fosters the widespread of fear in the population and create the so-called culture of fear that our contemporary society is subject to. Again, we live, I mean, the model I teach uh, from which this uh, session is taken, it lies also on the paradox uh, intrinsic in our society. We are in somehow very scared to become victim of a crime, at the same time, we are heavy consumer of uh, media representation of crime, whether it is a movie or a TV series, or it's fiction or real crime. We are heavy consumer, so there is this paradox. Okay, now I want to, to, give, I want to give you three concrete examples. We'll be looking, we'll be looking at in, uh, media representation of crime in general. I want to give you three examples, which are how media represent the criminal justice system, so lawyers, cops, prosecutors, juries, how they are represented in media, both in fictional and real media content. How media represent ethnic minorities in relation to crime. And finally, how media represent women in relation to crime. We will use the same scheme. We will look before our media content, how media represent the criminal justice system, and then why and then which are the consequences of this representation. So in terms of media content, how do media represent law enforcement? According to Surrett, which is an author, but even according, according, many, according to other academic authors, there is no an homogeneous representation of the criminal justice system in the media. There are some media such, for instance, those reality show, like such a, here in the UK, we got 
um, Body Squam Cup UK, for instance, anyway, maybe some of you know and watch these kind of programs, police show or news tabloid programs, the police, the criminal justice system in general is represented as efficient, so in a positive way. On the contrary, print and broadcast media tend, tend also to scrutinize, criticize, uh, and negative, uh, 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 portray the criminal justice system cops in particular in a negative way. However, the representation, as I say, is, is not homogeneous. As here I listed some way in which cops, for instance, have been represented since the 1980s until today in movies, TV series, in media, so in fictional and real uh, contents. They've been portrayed in a very different way as a rough, a corrupt cops, as a honest, as a body cops, as a comedy cops, and so on and so forth. Now, which is the consequence of this, uh, which is the reason why media are present in this not homogeneous, in this heterogeneous way, the criminal justice system. I mean, until the rise of the digital media, the criminal justice system had like cops, again, prosecutors, magistrates, judges, had an advantage in accessing and influencing the way media was reporting criminal cases because the criminal justice system was the only source of information. However, with the rise of digital media, things have changed. Today, media have at their disposal more source of information. They are more in competition with one another. And therefore, the criminal justice system is not anymore the unique source. They are, cannot impose their, their own way to reconstruct, to tell a given criminal case. At the same time, there is a widespread lack of confidence and trust in the criminal justice system, and this is reflected in the media. The effect of all this is that some heavy viewer watching a lot of violence on TV, they might develop a negative idea of the police as inefficient. Others might watch a lot of TV, a lot of representation of the criminal justice system as corrupted, and therefore they might develop a negative view on the criminal justice system. Some fragile groups might have a negative view on the criminal justice system because they feel unprotected. And again, every viewer of police drama shows might be likely to believe that police treated the wealthy better. On the contrary, those that view, uh, view a lot of crime solving shows believe that there was no preferential treatment. So there are different consequences a different uh, kind of effect on different type of viewers. So this is the first example. Another example of media representation of crime is the way media represent minor ethnicity in relation to crime. So how do media content, how do media represent ethnic minority in relation to crime? Well, according to Lyon, media tend to portray violent crime as on the rise, so we know that. Within this context, they tend to portray white people mostly as victims, black people mostly as the perpetrators, and they tend to encourage zero tolerance against crime. Researches on the criminal justice system suggest that harsher punishment are given as a consequence for crime involving uh, ethnic minorities compared to crime involving whites. This is an effort. We will talk about the effort in a second. Anyway, this is a way media represent ethnic minorities in relation to crime. They tend to report when they have to decide which news we report. If the perpetrator is black and the victim is white, it will sell a lot, is news worth, and therefore they reproduce, they, they cover that specific criminal event or case more than others. I suggest you to look if you go Netflix at the series when the CIAs talks about the Central Park Five case, which is a case in which the media saw the perpetrators were those five black kids. The, the, the victim was white. They understood that they would have made a lot of business reporting this case more, uh, many times. Right. So, uh, for what concern again, media representation, uh, how media represent ethnic minority in relation to crime, this author says for us, to us that for decades, black youth have been demonized in media discourse as the criminal other. Working class urban crime or mugging was progressively defined as a black crime. 
by the media. During the 1970s, black youth became associated with images of inner city unrest. So therefore the linkage of race, violence, dangerous and crime remain until today a high profile team. And then of course, like topics regarding drug gangs and street gangs are often related to certain ethnicity uh, by the media. Of course, this doesn't have a correspondence with reality, but that's what the media tend to do. Why they do that? Well, because those editors, executives, journalists we were talking about before that are profit oriented, at the same time, they tend to reproduce those values that of, the, of their own community. And most of the time they belong to communities uh, that are populated by upper class white professionals. So they replicate in their job those stereotypes about certain ethnic groups and they therefore link those ethnic groups with the notion of dang dangerousness and uh, with the um, rise in crime. Moreover, as Hall stressed, the construction of news discourse around a particular topic can depend very much upon the way in which a story is framed or defined by primary sources. Those primary sources are political, economic elite, which more often than not are white upper class professionals. So journalists, of course, we know that do not exist and operate in a vacuum, but they are subject of as well as key contributors to the dominant ideological discourses within which we all negotiate our idea, opinion, identities every day. So this is the reason why, but which are the consequences of this representation of ethnic minorities as a potential danger? Well, the consequences could be that we link, we correlate a certain group uh, with the idea of dangerousness. And we as a viewer, we have to include also, for instance, those working in the criminal justice system, such as cops, such as lawyers, such as members of the jury, such as judges. Those members of the criminal justice system are also viewers, and they will be in somehow influenced by this stereotype that links certain ethnic group with the rise in crime, with certain type of crime. So as Leon reports, this author's report, the first of crime for most people is a dark face. I mean, it refers to the US, but it could probably be the case even for the UK or other European country. Every study tells us that people simply view African-American in particular by Hispanic as well as the most dangerous. And so I'm going to dealing with a jury, whether they want or not, that have those stereotypes in mind. So the question is, the potential implication for jury outcomes is disturbing. Do you really want that decision about, for instance, life and death get in, is influenced by what a jury, mem a jury member saw on, the, on the cable TV last night? Now, of course, media efforts are not that straightforward. But the association of certain group as dangerous, immigrants, black, Hispanic, any ethnic minorities as dangerous, inevitably in some way will influence the public opinion. And with public opinion, we also include those working at the criminal justice system. Now, finally, I want to talk about the way media present women in relation to crime. Now, uh, if a man commit a crime, violent crime, he violates the criminal law. If a woman commit a violent crime, she doesn't just violate the criminal law, she also violates those norms and expectations associated that society associates with female behavior. Especially those women that are violent with kids are portrayed in the media much, much harsher than men committing the same type of crime because the returning to the idea of a patriarchal society that sees women as defenseless, as neutering, as caring, as maternal figures, it is in, 
in, in, uh, in strong contrast with the idea, I mean, a violent crime is, in, is strong committed by women, violates this expectation. So not just the criminal justice system. So having said that, the media tend to be more exaggerated, harsher, more exaggerated with women committing this type of crime than when men commit them. According to, to, these author, to, to those two authors, women who commit violent crime are often portrayed either as lunatic, as monsters, or as idiots, as abnormal. Abnormal, because it goes not only against the criminal law, I want to repeat, but against the expectation of society, the idea that society gives to women, the role, the gender role that society assigns to women. So it's a cultural factor, it's a so social factor. It's not just a criminological factor. So why this up? Why media uh, media uh, tend to treat harsher women who commit violent crime? Tra tend to portray them as lunatic, monster, and idiot? Because again, most of the media market is run by white male professionals who have these gender stereotypes in their mind, and they reproduce them with the job they do. And again, as it was in the case for ethnic minorities, society is still is not as much as it was in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. But we perfectly know that today in our society there is not gender equality, and our society is still patriarchally organized. So the 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 the, the, the set of values and principles that regulate society are more are, are decided by males so than females. And female, again, are assigned a role in society that is in complete contrast with violent crime. And therefore, that's why they tend to treat them more uh, harsher and than uh, their men counterpart. In terms of effect, do media representation women in relation to crime influence viewers? And again, with viewers, we have to include those working on the criminal justice system. Well, uh, if they commit pity crimes, no, Ac they actually opt. If a woman steals a car, it's not a violent crime, probably both the media and the criminal justice system will treat her in a more latent way. Whereas if the woman commits a violent crime, as I said, both the media and the criminal justice system will treat that woman in a harsher way. Uh, because again, she violated both the criminal law, uh, those expectations at society, this idea of defendless, uh, neutering, uh, caring, uh, um, and uh, maternal uh, figure that we have, that we attach to, um, uh, to women. Right. So again, in terms of effect, this media representation, this harsh representation of women who commit violent crime has got three functions. The first one is that such representation link women demand for equality with rise in crime. The logic is when women will be equal to men, they will commit the same amount of crime that men commit. So this is not good. This, of course, is a criticism to the feminist movement. Second, such representation can function as a warning. Young women should remain within the patriarchal and familiar control to minimize the chance to become not so much a perpetrator but a victim. And finally, mere representation of female criminality serves to demonize lesbian women because they tend to also demonize lesbian women. So to encourage, to celebrate only good, white, heterosexual, passive women as the cultural ideal. And whoever violate that ideal will be treated worse by both the media and the criminal justice system. Now, the last slide is about the model textbook, uh, which has been written by Greg Martin in 2018. The title is Crime, Media and Culture. You can find it at Middlesex Library. There is even an electronic copy. You can download all the chapters once you've got access to the library. And uh, I have actually concluded my session, Sophie. So was just wondering if you got any questions so we can open up the Q&A session. I'll probably be, be quick, but we got time for questions. Thank, Thank you me. very much. I can stop sharing.
We did have someone raise their hand. So if you were that person, then please do pop a message in the Q&A. Or if you would like, um, we can unmute your mic. Um, so please do, um, if you if you need to, just pop something in the Q&A and we can unmute you um, with no problem. But that was really, really interesting. Potentially what might be um, good to talk about is how, um, or kind of, more in depth what students might learn when they come to uh, Middlesex and how some of these articles can maybe be uh, related into their studies. Um, and we also do have another question here actually about accessing the slides. Yeah, so these sessions are recorded um, and they are easily accessible both on the Get Into Uni website um, as of tomorrow morning, or if you um, click back on the uh, link that you use to sign in with, the Zoom link, that will then take you to an on-demand session that you can watch back very shortly after we end today's um, meeting. Okay, so I'll hand back over to you, uh, Giuseppe. Yes, so, I mean, this is a module again, which um, cannot be inscribed within the so-called the mainstream uh, criminology. The approach is alternative, is uh, the approach is cultural criminology. The focus is on media because media, again, it, we are surrounded by media, especially nowadays. <coughs> and the focus is on how media construct, represent, uh, crime and uh, uh, and the culture, social uh, reason, even economic reason behind this type of presentation. <laughs> Excuse me. Clearly, this is not the all, um, I mean, I didn't cover all the topics that the module uh, offers. We, during the module, we've been looking at even media representation of serial killers. We've been looking at uh, how um, in movies, the scene is manipulated so that violence can be accepted. We've been looking at uh, how cinema represents violent, violence against women, especially rape. Um, we've been looking at the notion of trial by media, which are those cases when a criminal case, the media represented a specific criminal case can sell a lot. And therefore they create a sort of parallel trial where the defendant is already guilt is already guilty um, and the media carry on their own trial by publishing any type of information, whether fake or real. At the same time, the defendant has to defend he or, or himself in the court, in trial, and the criminal justice system might be influenced by the role played by media in over-reporting this case. I don't know if you never heard about the case of Amanda Knox in Italy, the American student who was accused to have killed a British student in Perugia in central Italy. Or again, the case I mentioned before, which has been, uh, um, which, which has been, uh, 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 I mean, it's the, fight, the, criminal, the Central Park Five. You can see a series about this criminal case in Netflix titled When They See Us. That was a case of trial by media. So the media carry on the young trial, accusing and convicting the defendant. In this case, they play there. So this is another topic of the model. Um, I don't know if you go any question, uh, just because uh, otherwise I carry on talking. Is there an interesting case? Well, uh, yeah. I see, for those of you, Elisa, to answer to your question, for those of you who got Netflix, I suggest you to look at Amanda Knox. You can type Amanda Knox, it's a case of trial by media, or when they see us. Then you can look at the amount of series of movies or documentaries or true documentaries that are about crime and violence. Again, this model lies on the belief that our society in, in, in on the one side is scare of crime because media, as I said, over exaggerate the amount of crime. But at the same time, we are we are heavy consumer of crime contents, heavy consumer of media representation of crime, heavy consumer of documentary regarding serial killer, regarding uh, in general in criminal investigation and so on and so forth. So it's a very popular topic. Um, Again, uh, as a type of as a as a type 
of documentary you can watch. Well, you can watch even, um, again, those two documentaries about trial uh, by media, Amanda Knox and When They See Us, but then again, any series that regard violence, regard crime, look at the role played by women in the series, look at the role played by ethnic minorities, because media, again, is a cultural representation, reflects, is a mirror of our so of the culture that operates in our societies, so it's a good thing uh, to analyze. Any other well, question? Another question: uh, Where can studying criminology get you? I think that's well, to real study, wise you know, of course, this background. is yeah. Thank you. Of course, criminology. Uh, this is just a model. This is just a. Um, uh, an approach to the study of crime and crime control. Uh, criminology gives you the opportunity to, well, to understand, uh, to understand society, to understand uh, how, um, well, I, for instance, teach a course for 30 year students about organized crime and white collar crime. So crime is not just uh, something that regards violent. There are those crimes that are not violent, but go like severe consequences. So studying criminology, you will acquire a lot of notion of sociology. You will acquire notion of economy. You will uh, learn um, research methods such as quantitative and qualitative research methods. You will better understand society um, and uh, of course, it gives you a lot of uh, opportunity in terms of um, career, uh, depending from your uh, specific uh, interest in criminology, whether you look at the justice system or you look at more, uh, again, white collar or organized crime, or you look more uh, culture criminology and so on. I mean, it's a very you know, big field of inquiry. So, which gives a lot of opportunities, has got a lot of interesting um, topic, a lot of interesting, uh, and topics that are, again, very close to our daily life, which are not, uh, are not abstract topics, abstract themes, abstract issues, but are issues that surround us every day. I mean, I don't know study abroad last year, so I would like to study in Europe, like in Italy or Switzerland. Uh, I know that during the third year, you will have the chance to do a stage in a company or in an institution. Uh, I'm not hundred percent whether this might include also European uh, countries. I suppose it does, uh, but um, I cannot give a complete answer on that on that sort about. But in, you know, I don't know about Sophie if she can help me with this. Uh... So there's opportunity for you to study um, abroad. I'm not sure directly for your particular course. Um, there's a, a, a kind of department within Middlesex that is called the International Mobility. And basically what they do is study abroad exchanges and placements. Um, and they recently did a, a live session at one of our open events. So the open event page is still live and you can watch it back. It's mdx.ac.uk forward slash UG hyphen live. And I can pop that in uh, the chat as well. They talk about um, the areas where you can study abroad depending on your courses. Um, and it's something, kind of separate from the course uh, necessarily. So um, it's not kind of like an integrated uh, year when you sign up for criminology. It's something that you, you might be able to do as part of being at university, if that makes sense. Um, but when I've spoken to them previously, they have said that um, most courses um, can take a, a year abroad placement. Um, the time difference does differ. So for some areas, you might only be able to do six months or for some other subject, you can do a, a full year's placement abroad, um, but they definitely have further information. So it's the international mobility team and I'll pop the link to the um, landing page where you can watch back the talk um, right now. Too much for that, thank you. Any other question, guys? For studying criminology, as I said, you will acquire a notion of economy, of sociology, of political science. 
because crime doesn't regard just certain classes or certain uh, type of person. Crime is committed by everyone, by the powerful, by the powerless, and uh, the economic crime, the environmental crime, uh, the crime against the person, violent crime, and so on and so forth. So by studying criminology, you will acquire a lot of notions and knowledge also regarding other field of inquiries. Something that might be interesting, we've still got a few minutes, um, yeah. is to, if you've got any maybe case studies or any um, kind of real highlights um, of the course of any anyone that's previously studied um, or some of the things that they've been involved in, perhaps people might want to know about yeah. that. Yeah, for instance, for the for the type of course uh, that is crime media and culture, we doing seminars. We tend to watch a lot of videos, a lot of uh, video material. So I've been showing to students, especially during the seminars, um, some scene from movies, or and then we've been discussing the the, the, the scene, or we've been looking at some uh, YouTube video about news news uh, news programs, so about criminal cases in general, uh, is a very dynamic model, which uh, again, is not just about reading academic sources, it's also about watching and then applying what you've been reading, uh, in, uh, applying your academic reading with what you've been watching. And after this model, you will look at things a bit different, it's like that you will wear some glasses that will give you the opportunity again to identify what role is given to this character and why, why crime is represented in this way and why and so on and so forth. Um, and again, I, I, I think, I believe that that topic very close to our own uh, daily life. So I'm not, it's not something that is far away from our life. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, let me read how is criminology examined. Okay, uh, of course, law criminal course. Well, I suppose that uh, the, to answer to the first question is there a difference between a criminology course and law with criminology course? Yes, there is. There will be like some common models, but then if you study law with criminology, I mean, you will have some as you know more specialized models. Uh, to ask that topic, um, as you know, there are different criminology model, criminology uh, courses. You can do criminology, you can do criminology with sociology, and so on and so forth. So, as you deal with many crimes, do you think death penalty should be abolished? No, this is a big question. Just was how is criminology examined? We go to a like sociology. We can uh, quantify crime, count crime, like statistics. And then uh, we can look at the reason why people commit crime with qualitative methods, uh, for instance, by interviewing, uh, by organizing focus group or ethnography, by observing. Except that, again, conventional criminology tend to look, uh, if we look at strict gangs, for instance, uh, conventional criminologists we will tend to categorize what type of activities and crime a strict gang. Uh, carries on um, how many times those crimes are committed and so on. A culture criminologist probably at his own or, own, or, or her own risk will ask access to this gang to observe the gang members, the way they talk, the way they dress, the way they are organized with each other, whether or not there is an hierarchy within the gang and so on and so forth. So all the culture phenomena, expression of that specific group of people. Now, uh, well, the, I personally don't believe death penalty is a solution. I believe that crime cannot be sorted just by punishment. I believe that crime can be also sorted by understanding why the social, cultural, political, economic reason why people commit crime. And this is uh, an important aspect of criminology, not only to prevent crime, but also to understand crime. Uh, is there a difference between... Uh, any other question? I hope I'm providing satisfying... You know, satis I, I hope I'm providing good answers. I think you might have answered everyone's questions, but we yes, have a little more did. time. 
um, as we did start slightly late. So again, thank you all for um, being so patient and um, staying with us this whole time. Um, I think that was a really, really insightful um, presentation. Thank and you thought, very much. Um, and I think everyone really enjoyed it. Um, I hope so. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Has anyone else got any more questions? We are around for a few more minutes. If you'd like to answer anything else, um, please do feel free. Um, or if you want us to unmute your mic so that you can speak, let us know. We can do that. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll hang on for a, a minute or so and then I'll um, end the session. I hope to see all of you next year. The course that Crime, Crime Media and Culture start in January is a second term uh, module. And uh, I hope to see all of you next year, of course. Especially at the campus, not anymore online. That will be, and it seems that we are going in that direction, which is a great thing. Yeah, definitely. Great and there are thing. lots of, sorry, there are lots of opportunities for anyone who does want to um, come along and see the campus. We're running campus tours, um, and we will also be kind of um, starting to do more things on campus for you to be able to come and see facilities and, and things like that. So do take advantage of that. You can book onto those via the webpage, mdx.ac.uk. Um, and yeah, if you want to come along and see the campus, then definitely do. It's a really, really good opportunity to just see where we are um, and see the facilities that we've got as well. Um, so we haven't had any more questions in the time that we've been speaking, so I will um, end today's session, but I just want to say a massive thank you. Um, and Giuseppe, do you, have, do you want to? I was wondering if I can leave my email address if some of you want to ask me maybe tomorrow or the day after some question about this model or the, you know, the, 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 the course in general, I would be happy to answer. I don't know. I can type my email address in the chat. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. If anyone wants um, the email address for uh, Giuseppe, then please do pop a message uh, in the uh, Q and A, um, and he'll be able to pop his email address in there. We don't have the chat function on this. Yeah, I can session. see that actually. I can see so that. if if anyone does want the um, if anyone does want your email address, they can just write that in in the Perfect. Q and A, and then you'll be able to um, send that across. Otherwise, is there a way to contact you via the web page? Are you on the um, subject specific pages? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I am. Yeah. yeah. OK, so for anyone um, who might leave this session after and think, oh, actually, I have a question, um, you can get Giuseppe's email address from the subject pages. So if you go onto our web page and type in criminology into the search bar or find your uh, specific course, you'll be able to send an email directly. Yeah, please do it. I, can, I will be happy to answer to other questions, to all of your questions. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you ever so much, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Sophie, for your help, support. Have a wonderful evening. Um, yeah. And yeah, hopefully we'll see some of you at our other sessions that we've got running this week. And as Giuseppe said, in the new academic year. Academic um, year. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening, all Thanks. of you. Bye-bye.